My name's Helen Collins, and I'm 29 years old. I work at the local library in a small town that many people probably haven't heard of. My life is simple, maybe too simple for some, but it's mine. I've always been the quiet type, preferring the company of books to the noisy outside world. The library is my sanctuary. It's a small old building with creaky floors and shelves that have seen better days, but to me, it's perfect. Every day, I open the library doors at 8 o'clock a.m., switch on the lights, and breathe in the familiar scent of books. It's a routine that never gets old. My parents passed away when I was young, so I was raised by my grandmother. She was kind, always encouraging me to read and learn. But now she's gone, and I'm all alone. No siblings, no close relatives, just me and my small world. Good morning, Helen. Mr. Jenkins, a regular visitor, greets me as he walks in. He's an elderly man who spends his days reading history books. Good morning, Mr. Jenkins. The new shipment of history books arrived yesterday. I set them aside for you, I reply with a smile. Ah, uh, you know me too well, dear, he chuckles, shuffling towards the designated shelf. The day unfolds with familiar faces coming and going. I help a group of kids find books for their school project, recommend a romance novel to Mrs. Harrison, and guide Mr. Thompson to the science fiction section. It's a quiet life, but I like it. I find comfort in the predictability, the routine. Then one day, everything changed. The day Jack walked into my life, he came in looking for a book, but I could tell he wasn't the regular library type. He seemed out of place with his crisp suit and confident stride. Can you help me find a book? He asked, his voice smooth and inviting. Of course. What are you looking for? I replied, trying to keep my composure. It's a novel. The Great Gatsby, I believe, I said, leading him to the classic section. As I handed him the book, our hands brushed briefly, sending a jolt through me. It was a simple touch, but it lingered in my mind. Thank you, Helen, he said, reading my name tag. I'm Jack. It's nice to meet you, Jack, I replied. That brief encounter marked the beginning of everything, the beginning of a love that I thought would last a lifetime, the beginning of a journey that would take me from the quiet life I knew into a world of chaos and betrayal. If only I had known then what I know now, maybe things would have been different. But life doesn't come with a warning label, and sometimes we just have to learn the hard way. After that first meeting, Jack started coming to the library more often. It was odd because he didn't strike me as the reading type. However, each time he came in, he'd ask for a book recommendation and then spend a few minutes chatting with me. One day he walked in just as I was struggling with a box of newly arrived books. Need a hand with that, he offered, walking over. That would be great, thanks, I said gratefully. As we placed the books on the shelves, he asked, So, Helen, what got you into working at a library? I shrugged. I've always loved books. They're like friends, you know. Plus, it's nice and quiet here. He laughed. I can see that. It's like a whole different world. Our conversations grew longer with each visit. I found out that Jack worked in his family's real estate business. He was easy to talk to, and for the first time in a long while, I felt genuinely interested in. Then one day he surprised me. Helen, would you like to have dinner with me tonight? He asked, a hopeful look in his eyes. I was taken aback. Like a date? Yes, like a date, he smiled. I hesitated. This was new territory for me, but there was something about him that made me want to say yes. Okay, sure. I'd like that, I replied, trying to keep my voice steady. We went to a small restaurant in town. It wasn't fancy, but it was cozy. We talked about everything and nothing, and for a few hours, I forgot about my usually solitary life. Walking home, Jack said, I had a really great time tonight, Helen. You're very different from the people I usually meet. I didn't know how to respond, so I just smiled. He continued, I'd like to see you again. Would that be okay? I nodded. Yes, I'd like that. 
From then on, we started seeing each other more regularly. He'd take me out to dinner or we'd go for walks. It was nice. For once, I felt like I was part of something more, part of a world that wasn't just about books and quietness. It wasn't long before I fell for him hard. He was charming and attentive, and he made me feel special. When he proposed, I didn't hesitate. I said yes. Looking back, I wish I had seen the signs. I wish I had known that the charm was just a mask, a cover for something much less pleasant. But love has a way of blinding you, of making you ignore the warning signs, and I was very much in love. Or at least I thought I was. After Jack and I got engaged, things started to change. It began with his parents. They didn't approve of me from the start. They thought I was beneath their son because I didn't come for money. The first time I met them was at their house for dinner, and I was nervous. It was a big, fancy house, nothing like what I was used to. Helen, this is my mother, Margaret, and my father, Richard, Jack introduced. Nice to meet you, I said, trying to smile. Margaret looked me up and down. Him, so you're the girl who works at the library, she remarked. Yes, I am, I replied, feeling smaller by the second. Richard chimed in, Jack, couldn't you find someone more suitable? I felt like crawling into a hole. The dinner was long and uncomfortable. They made it clear they thought I wasn't good enough for their son, but Jack stood up for me, which made me love him even more. Before our wedding, they insisted on a prenuptial agreement, saying it was just a formality. I didn't have much to lose, so I agreed without making a fuss. Once we got married, I moved into Jack's house, which was actually his parents' house. They had given it to him as a wedding gift, but they acted like it was still theirs. His parents came over all the time, unannounced. They'd walk in and start ordering me around. Helen, make us some coffee. Margaret would demand as soon as she walked in, and I would, without saying anything. I didn't want to cause trouble. One day, Margaret pointed at the TV and said, Remember, Helen, in case of divorce, you can't claim this. It was like that with everything. They constantly reminded me that nothing in the house was mine. Jack started changing, too. He wasn't the man I fell in love with. He began joining in on the jokes his parents made about me. One evening, while deciding what to wear for a family event, I asked Jack for his opinion. This one makes you look less drab, he said, laughing. I was hurt. It felt like he was a different person around his parents. He no longer stood up for me. Instead, he laughed along with them. Living in that house was exhausting. I felt like an outsider, an unwanted guest. I kept hoping things would get better, but they only got worse. The stress started affecting my health. I began having severe stomach pains. I tried to ignore them, but one day I collapsed at the library. I woke up in the hospital. The doctor said it was stress-related. I ended up staying there for a few days, but Jack didn't visit or even call. I felt so alone. Then one day a notary came to my room with news. My great aunt, someone I barely remembered, had passed away and left me her fortune, $30 million. I couldn't believe it. I didn't even know what to do with that kind of money. Suddenly, I wasn't just the poor girl from the library anymore. When Jack and his parents found out, they came to visit, suddenly all smiles and sweetness. Darling, we're so happy for you, Margaret said, her voice dripping with fake concern. Yes, we're a family. We should support each other, Richard added. I didn't buy it. It was too much of a change. After they left, I overheard them talking outside my room. They didn't know I was listening. She's such a fool. Can you believe our luck? Jack laughed. We need to make sure she doesn't leave you, Jack. Maybe you should have a child with her. That will tie her down, Margaret suggested. I felt sick to my stomach. These people didn't care about me. They just wanted my money. That moment I knew what I had to do. I had to get out of that house, away from these people. I had to take control of my life. I wasn't going to be their victim anymore. I left the hospital with a plan in my mind. I knew what I had to do. When I got home, 
Jack and his parents were waiting, all smiles, acting like the caring family they never were. Oh, Helen, we were so worried about you, Margaret exclaimed. I nodded but didn't say much. I needed to act normal, not to tip them off. Jack came closer. So when do you get the inheritance, he asked, a little too eagerly. I looked at him, the man I thought I loved, and realized I didn't even recognize him anymore. Soon, I said, but it's not something you need to worry about. His smile faltered a bit. But we're married, Helen. What's yours is mine, right? He insisted. I forced a smile. Of course, darling. That night I couldn't sleep. Their voices echoed in my head, their fake concern, their greed. It made me sick. I got up and started writing. I wrote down everything they had done, everything they had said. It was like a dam had broken, and years of pent-up frustration and pain poured out. The next morning, I had a meeting with a lawyer. I explained everything, showed him the prenuptial agreement. He was shocked, but assured me that the agreement would protect me. You're doing the right thing, he assured me. When I got back, I found Jack and his parents in the living room. They looked up as I walked in. There she is, our brave girl, Richard said with a smile that didn't reach his eyes. I sat down, clutching my purse. I have something to say, I began. They all looked at me, curious. I'm filing for divorce, I said, my voice steady. The room went silent. Then Margaret erupted. What? You ungrateful little. Jack was on his feet. Helen, you can't be serious. We love you. Do you, Jack? Because I don't feel loved. I feel used, I replied calmly. Margaret was fuming. We'll sue you. We'll take half of your inheritance. I reached into my purse and pulled out a copy of the prenuptial agreement. Actually, you can't. This says neither of us can claim the other's property in case of divorce. They were speechless. For the first time, I felt in control. I stood up. I'm leaving. I don't want any of you to contact me. I walked out of that house, their shouts and insults trailing behind me. It was the hardest thing I'd ever done, but as I drove away, I felt a weight lift off my shoulders. I was free, free from their disdain, their manipulation. For the first time in a long while, I felt like I could breathe. I didn't know what the future held, but I knew it had to be better than the past. I rented a small apartment in the city. It was nothing fancy, but it was mine. For the first time in years, I felt a sense of peace. I was still dealing with the divorce, but I felt like I could handle it. One day, I got a call from the lawyer. Helen, there's something you should know about your great aunt's will, he said. I was puzzled. What about it? There's a condition. You need to use a portion of your inheritance for a charitable cause. It was your great aunt's final wish. I was surprised. I had no idea. The lawyer continued. She was quite the philanthropist. It seems she wanted to pass that on to you. I hung up the phone deep in thought. My great aunt had given me a chance to do something good. It felt like a sign, a push in a new direction. I started researching charities and causes. I wanted to do something meaningful, something that would make a difference. That's when I stumbled upon a small organization that helped women who were victims of domestic abuse. It struck a chord with me. I contacted them and set up a meeting. The woman I met, Linda, was passionate and dedicated. We provide shelter, legal aid, and counseling to women who have nowhere else to go, Linda explained. I listened, moved by the stories she shared. I want to help, I said, feeling a sense of purpose I hadn't felt in years. With Linda's guidance, I used a part of the inheritance to fund a new shelter. It was an incredible feeling, knowing I was helping other women find a way out, just like I had. A few weeks later, Linda invited me to the opening of the shelter. It was a small event, but the atmosphere was full of hope and gratitude. As people mingled, I noticed a familiar face in the crowd. It was Sarah, an old colleague from the library. Helen, is that you? She asked, surprised. Sarah, it's been so long, I said, hugging her. 
what are you doing here? I told her about the shelter, about my involvement. She listened, her eyes wide. That's incredible, Helen. I had no idea. It's a new chapter for me, I said, smiling. We spent the evening catching up. It felt good to reconnect with an old friend. It felt like pieces of my life were slowly falling back into place. As the event wrapped up, Linda came over. Helen, I can't thank you enough. This shelter will change lives. I looked around at the faces of the women who now had a safe place to go. It's the least I could do, I said, feeling a warmth in my heart that I hadn't felt in a very long time. The days started to blend into one another, each filled with the rewarding work at the shelter. I was finding a new sense of purpose, something that was truly mine. Then, out of the blue, my phone rang. It was a number I hadn't seen in a while, Jack. My heart raced with a mixture of emotions, but curiosity won. Hello, Jack, I said, my voice calm. Helen, I need to talk to you. Can we meet? It's urgent. His voice sounded desperate. Reluctantly, I agreed to meet him at a public coffee shop, hoping that being in a familiar place would give me strength. Sitting across from Jack, he looked different, defeated, almost pitiful. His eyes were pleading. Helen, I made a huge mistake. I want you back. I've realized how much you mean to me, he blurted out. I looked at him, feeling nothing but contempt. Why now, Jack? He sighed. My parents, they controlled everything. They were the reason our marriage failed. I was weak, but I'm different now. I felt a surge of anger. You blame your parents. You stood by while they treated me like dirt. You laughed with them, Jack. He reached for my hand, but I pulled away. Please, Helen, I know I was wrong. I've changed. I stared at him, seeing the man I once loved but now felt nothing for. Changed or not, it's too late. I feel nothing for you, Jack. Nothing but contempt. His face fell, and for a moment, I saw a glimpse of the man I married, but it was fleeting. I'm sorry, Jack. I've moved on. I have a life now, a purpose. There's no place for you in it, I said firmly. He nodded slowly, a look of resignation on his face. I understand. I just had to try. Leaving the coffee shop, I felt a weight lift off my shoulders. It was over, truly over. The next day, there was an event at the shelter. A local artist had donated a sculpture to be unveiled in the garden. As I stood there surrounded by people who supported and believed in me, I felt a sense of belonging. Sarah, my old colleague from the library, stood beside me. You've done something amazing here, Helen, she said, smiling. The artist pulled the cover off the sculpture, revealing a figure of a woman reaching up to the sky. It symbolized hope, strength, and new beginnings. Applause filled the air, and for a moment, everything felt right in the world. Linda, the woman who had helped me so much, came over. Helen, this is just the beginning. There's so much more we can do. I looked around at the faces filled with hope and knew she was right. This was my new beginning, and I was ready to embrace it fully. My new life was busy and fulfilling. Every day at the shelter brought new challenges and rewards. My confidence grew, and for the first time in years, I felt in control of my destiny. I even started taking self-defense classes, something I would have never imagined doing before. One day, as I was leaving the shelter, I saw a car parked outside. It was my mother-in-law, Margaret, and she stepped out as soon as she saw me. Helen, we need to talk, she said, her voice softer than I'd ever heard. I have nothing to say to you, Margaret, I replied, my voice steady. Please just hear me out. I've realized how wrong we were, she pleaded. I stopped and looked at her. She seemed genuine, but I couldn't forget the past. What do you want, Margaret? I want to apologize. I treated you terribly. I've lost my son because of it, and I don't want to lose you too. You were like the daughter I never had, she said, her eyes glistening with tears. I felt a pang of sympathy, perhaps, but I pushed it away. 
Margaret, you made my life a living hell. An apology won't change that. I've moved on, and I suggest you do the same, I said firmly. She reached out to me, but I stepped back. Please, Helen, I know I can't undo the past, but I want to make things right. I shook my head. It's too late for that. Goodbye, Margaret. As I walked away, I felt her gaze on my back, but I didn't look back. I had learned to stand up for myself, and there was no going back to the way things were. The next day, I received a letter from Jack's lawyer. He was contesting the divorce settlement. I wasn't surprised, but I was ready. I met with my lawyer, a sharp woman named Rachel. He's got no leg to stand on, Helen. The prenuptial agreement is clear. He's just trying to intimidate you, she said confidently. I nodded. I'm not afraid of him anymore. Let's fight this. The court date arrived, and I walked in with my head held high. Jack was there with his lawyer, and for a moment, our eyes met. There was a flash of the old Jack, the one I had loved, but it vanished quickly. The judge listened to both sides and then made her decision. The prenuptial agreement stood, and Jack's claims were dismissed. I felt a surge of relief and triumph. After the court session, Jack approached me. Helen, I'm sorry. I was wrong, he said, his voice low. I looked at him, seeing the man I once loved but now felt nothing for. Goodbye, Jack. Take care of yourself, I said and walked away. As I left the courtroom, I felt a sense of closure. That chapter of my life was finally over, and a new one was just beginning. At the shelter, we were planning a fundraiser, and it was taking all my attention. The support from the community was overwhelming, and I felt a deep sense of gratitude. The night of the fundraiser arrived, and the place was buzzing with energy. People from all walks of life had come to support our cause. As I looked around, I realized how far I had come from a quiet, timid woman to someone who stood up for herself and others. Helen, you did it. This is amazing, Sarah said, coming up to me. I smiled. We did it, and there's so much more to do, I replied. As the event went on, I felt a sense of accomplishment and purpose. This was my life now, and I was exactly where I was meant to be.